in the way that's most suitable. Thanks. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay, cool. Uh, so feel free, uh, we can keep this fairly interactive if you like, and um, uh, I see the clock in front of me. Um, I'll try to stop it by like 1.50 or something like that. Is that about right? Yeah? Um, great. So what I wanted to do is talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing in my group at Harvard over the last few years in the area of um, sensor networks as applied to various domain science problems and specifically the operating system and programming model that we need in order to manage the resources on them. Okay, so um, just diving right in, I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with what sensor networks are, but just to get everybody on the same page, basically a sensor network is a, a consists of these embedded devices. They uh, uh, include uh, embedded processor, uh, low power wireless radio, various types of sensors. And uh, the typical hardware, there's a lot of these uh, sensor moat platforms that have been developed over the years. Typical moat platform will have about an 8 megahertz CPU, a few tens of kilobytes of memory. Uh, low power radio, not 802.11, but 802.15.4 typically, which is a low bit rate, low power wireless standard. Uh, and of course, various sensors. And the reason that the uh, devices are designed to have such constrained resources is primarily to keep the power consumption extremely low. The concept is that the devices are should designed to operate for weeks, months, even years without having to change the batteries. And so that also brings the device size down and makes it much easier to embed them in the environment. So the power consumption, the typical platforms we have today, around 70 milliwatts when, it, when it's active, when the CPU and the radio are, are on, and uh, can drop down into a, a several microwatt sleep state, which is great for uh, prolonging battery life if you can duty cycle the sensor, yeah? Uh, so uh, these, these sensor networks have been used for a lot of exciting application domains, uh, and one of the things I really like about working in this area is that it gives us this opportunity to connect the technology to real domain science users. So, you know, groups at Berkeley have done wireless sensors up in redwood canopies in order to monitor microclimates. Um, group at Princeton's placed them on collars of zebras with GPS trackers so that they can track herds of wildlife. Uh, there's a group at Vanderbilt that have used um, acoustic sensors to uh, localize the source of a gunshot if it's being fired in an urban warfare scenario. So that's an anti-sniper system. Uh, another group at Berkeley's uh, instrumented the Golden Gate Bridge with sensors all along it to monitor the vibrations and uh, understand the loads placed on the bridge. My group at Harvard, we've done work on monitoring volcanic eruptions. I'll talk a little bit about that. And we've also worked on uh, emergency medical care and disaster response. So there's a lot of really cool, exciting applications uh, that uh, uh, bank off of this technology. Okay, so the key challenge that I want to focus on today is uh, managing the very limited resources on the sensor devices. So as I mentioned earlier, we're dealing with slow CPUs, tiny, tiny amounts of memory, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of kilobits per second on the radio bandwidth, and that's, that's really an ideal case. And in most cases, you don't even get that performance in the real world, and small batteries. So because of this, I'm going to argue that the, the resource constraints here mean that you can't just think about managing resources the old way. You really need to have resource management as a fundamental primitive in the programming model. So if you think about the way we do resource management today on a conventional operating system, it's, it, you know, it's very much a kind of a laissez-faire kind of approach. The only API in the Unix you know, uh, API that we tend to program to that ever tells you if you don't have enough resource available is malloc, right? If you take malloc, you try to use malloc, and you ask for too much memory, what do you get back? Null. But what are you supposed to do if you get back null? Crash, probably. I mean, there's, nothing you, there's not really nothing you can do at that point. You're screwed royally. Yeah, so the point is that we don't tend to think this way when we program, because resources are usually plentiful. And the operating system APIs that we deal with assume that. And, and so the idea that resource or resources are constrained is a is a, uh, is sort of an exception, not the norm. So I'm going to argue in the sensor network uh, environment, we don't have that luxury. And so we really need to have an approach to software design that enables careful management of resources at both the node level and the network level. What I mean by that is, yes, we need to be worried about how the software uses the resources on each device. But really, a sensor network is not just a collection of individual devices. It's a network that operates as a single distributed computer. And the different nodes in a sensor network can trade off what, they, what operations they perform in order to assist each other. So a good example is 
routing packets through the network. I can consume more energy locally to forward packets for other nodes in the network. Yeah? And so we need to have some way of coordinating those activities across the network as a whole. So what I'm going to try to drill into your heads today is a mantra that I call resource-aware programming, the concept that we want to make resources a first-class entity in the programming model and force application programmers to reason about resource consumption uh, throughout their application software. Are there any questions before I go on? Not yet? OK, cool. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly talk about two driving applications that we've worked on to motivate the need for this stuff to give you all a, a, another level of detail. And then I'm going to talk about two systems that we've developed to manage these, uh, to, do the, to, to address the resource management challenge. The first is Pixie, which is an operating system for sensor nodes that allows you to use this resource-aware programming uh, model, and Lance, which is a framework for managing the resources across the network as a whole. And then I'll wrap it up. Yes? So is Lance the, if these sensor networks are connecting to the larger resource-rich sensor networks, is Lance the resource-rich sensor network that is managing resource-constrained? That's one way of thinking about it. I'll get to this, but Lance effectively is a centralized controller that knows about what the sensor network is doing and then decides how to allocate resources within the network. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, to give you a little bit more background on the application domains, because I think it's important to understand, you know, why, you know, why we have this challenge in the first place. One um, application we've been working on for a few years with um, seismologists from a couple of different universities is using wireless sensors for volcano monitoring. And the idea, this is just a cartoon version of this. I mean, I could give a 90-minute talk just on this, but I'll do it in one slide instead. Um, we place sensors on the volcano. They monitor acoustic and seismic signals, the seismic signals being the ground motion generated by the earthquakes and explosions. Um, there's a GPS receiver that acts as the root of a time synchronization protocol, so that establishes a global time base. And we use uh, long-distance radio modems to relay data back to an observatory that is some distance from the volcano itself because you don't want to you know, physically be there when the thing is going off. Uh, the uh, volcano uh, uh, does something interesting. Uh, in the volcanoes we've worked with, uh, this is happening uh, dozens or maybe hundreds of times a day, so it's extremely active. Um, this might be an explosion or it might be a small earthquake down inside of the volcano. And the sensors detect the, the acoustic and seismic trace from that event and relay this data over our multi-hop uh, network back to the base station which collects the data and stores it and then the seismologist will look at it later. So what you get out of one of these earthquakes would be a picture like this. This is time on the x-axis and each of the colored traces is the seismic signal from a single sensor node and a seismologist would look at that and say that's a small volcano tectonic earthquake. Okay? Yeah? So again, greatly simplifying the details but just to give you an appreciation for that. We've done three deployments of sensor networks on active volcanoes in Ecuador. Over the last few years, this is at Reventador uh, in August 2005. Um, to label the picture, that's Conrad Lawrence, a former graduate student of mine. What he's, install he's installing a, a sensor node here, and the radio antennas are elevated on these PVC pipes to keep them above the ground so that they, you know, we get reasonable range. Um, attached to this node here is the GPS receiver, and this is the radio modem with the Yagi antenna pointing back to the observatory. Uh, solar panels to charge a car battery inside of that. So there's one car battery. But basically, he's got one of the sensor nodes here. And what he's setting up is a, this is the moat. And attached to the moat is an a, a analog to digital conversion board that we designed. Uh, this is the radio antenna connector. And that connects out to the microphone and the seismometer. OK? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's only one of these for the entire network. These, each one of the sensor nodes is the size of a, a small little, little box like that. Right. And so I guess my question is, you, you're doing a ton of gymnastics to get around resource. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Clearly power has a yep. Problem, yep, yep. power, if, you, if size isn't constrained, why couldn't you just add more of that rather than Size is absolutely constrained. Size is the number one constraint. And the biggest reason for that is we are physically carrying these on our backs by foot for four hours through the jungle, you've probably read the paper, to get to the deployment site and uh, to carry all this equipment in, 
it, well, let me, let me show you the picture. So what we're replacing with this little portable thing here was a monitoring station that looks like this. This is what the seismologist used to use. And this is a data logger here. You put a compact flash card inside. There's no telemetry, no networking. This is just logging the data locally. And it's powered by two car batteries, right? So this is what they used to do. And I think you can appreciate that if you want to put a lot of monitoring stations on a volcano, that having to haul one of these out for each one of the monitoring stations is a tremendous effort. And believe me, it is. I, at this point in the talk, I usually make a joke about how many people have carried a car battery on their back up the side of a volcano. Uh, I gave a talk on this at the US Geological Survey, and everyone raised their hand. <laughs> so did I address your question? So this is the. This, yeah, yeah. So basically, the way of thinking about it is to carry this into the field takes four to five people to carry one station. To carry this into the field, I, weak computer scientist who's not in shape, can carry six stations in a backpack, including the antennas, the PVC pipes, the sensors, everything. So one person to six sensors versus five people to one sensor. So that's a order of 30 improvement. Right. I guess maybe what I'm saying is RAM is pretty small. What's that? Yeah, it's power hungry, yeah. So I guess my question is, is it, are there resources you could have added to these things? If they didn't need to be... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like a dollar bill size. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, one could argue that this could be like a PDA or smartphone class platform, but then the battery life would be about one-fourth to one-fifth of what we get here. So we get about two to three weeks battery life out of this with nothing smart going on in the software. So, yeah, I mean, the question is, where's the sweet spot in this? And I, I actually think that the current sweet spot, this is the technology we had available in 2005, the current sweet spot is something that has somewhat more capacity, but it's still not a PC class device. It's like a PDA. Any other questions? Okay, so um, the other application we've done, and this, is, this one drives home the need for small sizes and small batteries even further, which is using these devices in a wearable setting uh, to monitor limb movements of patients being treated for various neuromotor diseases, including Parkinson's and epilepsy and stroke. So the idea is we have these little sensors. It's called the shimmer. And uh, it's about the size of a Zippo lighter. Actually, this is way too big. We'd like this thing to be about a quarter of the size of this, and we think it's possible to do that. And the patient wears these on their arms and legs. They might wear eight or ten of these sensors. Each one has a triaxial accelerometer and gyroscope, and it's monitoring very high-resolution limb movements, which the data is then collected and then analyzed in order to understand how well the person is doing. So if you have Parkinson's disease, one of the things that affects you is these tremors, these dyskinesias, bradykinesias, other types of... Uh, uh, motor uh, fluctuations. What the uh, doctors want to understand is over the course of several weeks with changes in the dosage of their medication, do those things happen more or less often and are more or less severe based on the treatment that the patient's getting? Does this kind of make sense? And the best way to do that is in situ monitoring right on the patient's body, wear these sensors every day for several weeks on end, and collect all this data and do this processing and this analysis. Yeah? Okay, so this, in this case, it's got to be really, really small and lightweight and wearable, yeah? So that, that drives the power consumption way down because the battery has to be small. Okay, so the, the thing I want you to notice about these applications, the first is that the data rates are relatively high, at least from a sensor network perspective, that we're sampling sensors at about 100 hertz, and that's much, much higher than most sensor network applications that are operating at the sort of sample the temperature once every few minutes type, type regime. Um, we also really care a lot about timing accuracy because we're doing signal collection. You have to match the signals across multiple nodes and compare them. Um, the processing that's done on the signals we collect is domain specific. That's not something that I want to become an expert in. I don't want to have to understand the seismic wave analysis that the volcanologists do. They should be writing that code. They should be the ones who are specifying how we process the data because they're the experts in this. Yeah. And so it's very challenging every time you go to a new application domain to go and tailor the software completely because you've got domain-specific processing that we computer scientists don't really understand that well. And finally, I'm going to argue that the application software really does need to adapt its behavior based on the resource availability. You can't just assume that the resources are fixed over time and write your software to fit within that because that greatly underutilizes the resources that you do have available. So, for example, um, the volcano, most of the time it's quiet, but it's punctuated by periods of high level of activity. If I design my software for the worst case scenario, 
then I'm not necessarily going to be able to take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of periods of time when this volcano is just not doing anything interesting and I should be able to, you know, power down the sensors or save energy in various ways, right? Um, likewise, if I have this uh, wearable application here, the, the radio bandwidth that these nodes experience to, say, a laptop in the per patient's home is going to fluctuate considerably based on where the patient is. And in some cases, they might leave the house and have no radio bandwidth back to the base station. And so you actually want the sensors to notice that and to power down the radio and save energy because they're not able to uh, transmit any data at that time. Okay? So adaptation, I think, is really key when you're in such a constrained uh, it, it's such a constrained environment. I hope there's not too much disagreement on that point. That's, that's kind of the, the focus of the argument. So the way this is done today in TinyOS, which is the conventional operating system used on sensor networks, is you design your application as a bunch of modules, software modules with uh, complex wirings and interconnections between them. And this, is, this comprises your application. And I don't want you to worry too much about the details of the boxes and the, the labels and so forth. This is just a tiny OS version of the motion analysis application I was describing earlier. What I want you to notice is that inside each of these software modules, there are one or more control knobs, parameters that you can tune at runtime that affect the resource consumption and the data fidelity that it achieves. So a good example is I might have a, a knob that allows me to adjust the refresh rate of the synchronization protocol. And if I increase the refresh rate, I'm using more energy, but I'm getting finer grain time synchronization, right? I can increase or decrease the buffer sizes for my logging module and change the, both the memory and the energy consumption and the amount of data I can log, okay? So there's a tremendous number of knobs in here that in order to get good performance and good efficiency, you have to go around tweaking and turning and setting these knobs basically by hand in order to get the performance you want. So this is a lot like, you know, sitting behind the cockpit of a 747. It's just got a tremendous number of knobs and dials and, 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 uh, and widgets to, to change, I'm going to argue that this is not something that I want a volcanologist having to become an expert in doing. Yeah? So what I really like is something more like this. Yeah? It gives us a few degrees of freedom. Yeah? But it still enables some amount of control, but it's a lot easier to use. Do you have a question? I was going to say proof by picture. Proof by picture. Yeah? So we don't want to take all the control away from the programmer, but we want to greatly simplify this problem, okay? So our approach here is the Pixie operating system. So we, we, we have, have done a lot of work in the sensor network uh, programming field, and I you know, you know, built all these applications by hand and had gone through the pain of doing it. I said, look, maybe a new OS API is going to help us here because it's going to give us the right interfaces for thinking about resources. And so in Pixie, the idea is we want to make it easier or easy to write these adaptive applications. And I'm going to argue that you cannot delegate resource management entirely to the OS. This is something we typically do. I don't think that's reasonable when we're that resource constrained. I think that that's a, that's a fantasy that some people have, that I'm just going to slap some OS or some middleware in there. It's going to do everything magically for you. I don't believe in that. I believe that the application has to be involved in this decision-making process. And so the question is, how do we enable resource awareness without placing undue burden on the programmer with an emphasis on the word undue? There's going to be some programmer burden to doing this, but I hope that the burden is much lower than doing it by hand. So let me show you uh, uh, an example of an application developed in Pixie uh, kind of from a cartoon perspective. So this is the motion analysis application that I showed you earlier redone in Pixie. And in Pixie, you design your application as a set of software modules that I call stages. And those of you who know me from before I started working on sensor networks will realize that's my favorite word, so I had to reuse it here. And a stage is just a software module that performs some amount of computation or I.O. There's uh, edges that connect the stages so that we can have data flow between them. And uh, queuing is optional, so there's not, you don't always mandate queuing in front of a stage. But the nice thing about this programming style is that it maps very, very nicely onto the structure of most sensor network applications. They're acquiring sensor data or receiving radio messages. They're passing it through various things. They're processing it. They're saving it to flash. And they're transmitting things over the radio. So this is a very natural programming model for most people. Um, in this application, uh, what we're doing here is sampling the gyroscope and the accelerometer. We're noticing first whether or not the sensor's moving. If the data's, if the sensor's still, it's not moving, we just drop the data because we can save energy if it's, if it's not doing anything interesting. 
if the data, if the sensor is moving, then we want to pass the data to this bank of feature extractors that perform some rudimentary analysis on the signal uh, to uh, uh, produce these high-level features representing the accelerometer data. Okay, so rather than just taking the raw accelerometer data and trying to transmit it, we're doing some onboard processing on the device. We also log the raw signal to flash because we have a two gigabyte of flash on this device, so that will allow us to store up to a month of sensor data locally, which we can download later. And then these features are then transmitted over the radio link back to the laptop base station in the patient's home. Any question about what's going on at the application level here? It's pretty simple. I I'm, I'm got rid of some of the details, but hope this makes sense. Okay, so um, what we're doing here is uh, in Pixie, if any software, any stage wants to consume resources, it must request permission from the operating system to do that. And this is done uh, by asking for what's called a resource ticket. So I'll explain this in a moment. So let's say that this device, th this uh, uh, stage here wants to perform some computation. In order to do that, that's going to consume energy. And in Pixie, the model is there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. You always have to get resource tickets for any resource you want to consume. So this module would request from the Pixie operating system a ticket for the amount of energy it wants over some time horizon. With the, the, the time horizon represents a, an expiry time on, on the ticket that it's going to get back. Okay? So it's saying over the next 10 seconds, I'd like to use 700 millijoules of energy. So if that energy is available in the battery, it will get back a ticket that represents the right to consume that resource until that deadline. And then when it wants to perform the computation, it then would then redeem the ticket, handing it back to the operating system, and that says to the OS, okay, I'm now using the energy that I've got the ticket for. Yes? I'm not sure what you mean by the question. It just means to say to the OS, I want to do this computation. It's going to use energy. In order to get to use the energy, I have to hand you back the ticket. So do you hand the OS a thread constructor and say, I'd like to do the proof associated with this thread or the feature call? Or there, we don't have threads in this operating system, so that's not really relevant. You basically just, in front of a procedure call, you say, here's the ticket and here's the function I want to invoke. Yes? Ah, very good question. How do I estimate how much energy I need? Well, there's a whole host of offline profiling tools that we've developed and others have developed to do that kind of thing. So that's fairly well established in the SensorNet community, so we haven't really worried too much about that problem. Yeah? So how do I say no? If you don't have threads, I got nothing like to schedule if I don't like to do the job. Uh, well, how do I say no? Instead of giving you back a ticket, I can say no ticket. Sorry, buddy. But I give you back the CPU. They're going to burn energy. Ah. One of the things, I'm going to come to this in a moment, you're, ask, you're anticipating my next slide, but effectively we assume that the application and the OS are cooperative in the sense that the application isn't going to try to game the OS, it has no reason to do so. So if it's told no, it's going to cooperate with that and not just burn energy. Does that make sense? I mean, we're not trying to enforce this at a level of preventing you from using energy. There's lots of things you could do at the machine code level to just burn energy that we couldn't prevent you from doing. We're assuming that the application writer, in choosing to use Pixie to develop their application, uh, is going to behave. So I guess my point, maybe you're, I'm just anticipating your slide, but what would I do instead? You came back and said no. Ah, Correct. good question. I could ask for less energy to do something else. I could just say I'm not going to process that bank of uh, data. I mean, that's the, that's the deeper question, which is this now enables you to adapt I mean, given the explicit feedback on the fact that the energy is not available, so that allows me to do something at the programmer level in advance of being told no. Instead of being told no at the time I try to use the energy, I've decoupled the request from the use of the resource. Yeah? These still seem like local decisions. Is there a way in which you programmers can still think globally? Yes, let me come to this. You're all asking the right questions. I'm getting, I'm, I, I realize that I'm kind of going slow. Let me, get, let me skip ahead and get to this, and, and all your questions will be answered, I hope. So just to give another example of this, if I want to then transmit the results of the computation, I need to request the bandwidth ticket. So I want to say I want to transmit, say, two packets sometimes over the next five seconds. I get back the ticket. I would then bind the ticket to the radio packet that I want to transmit, pass both of those to the radio link stage, which would then redeem the ticket on my behalf and transmit the packet. So what's important here is that I'm decoupling the request for resource from the use. And tickets are, I can exchange them. I can pass them around the application. So one of the stages can request tickets. Another stage can redeem them. Okay, so the mechanics of ticket 
ticket should be pretty clear at this point. This is just an underlying mechanism to allow us to reason about resources. So I just said these things, and they're also very expressive because they're fairly low level. Um, now, the thing I want to emphasize is that the idea that I give you back a ticket saying this ticket represents the right to consume energy or bandwidth, it's difficult to make a strict, hard guarantee about resource availability. Radio bandwidth is a good example. If I give you a ticket to transmit 10 radio packets and the patient moves away from the base station, there's no guarantee we'll be able to successfully transmit those packets to the base station. So we don't want to, uh, uh, you know, the model is not that you treat the ticket as a right or a guarantee. It's simply a strong hint that the resources are available for you to use. But they're not a guarantee. And so the way of thinking about this is that even if I have a ticket, the operating system can revoke that ticket even before I've told you it should be revoked, which is the expiry time. And a good mental model for this is uh, tickets that we use all the time, which is like airline tickets, right? Having an airline ticket by no means gives you a guarantee that you're getting onto that airplane, right? At best, the airline ticket will let you pass the security, the, the security check. Right? But it will not necessarily guarantee that you get onto a specific flight at a specific day at a specific time. Okay? But yet they're still useful. I mean, we use these all the time. There's a very large industry <laughs> built around this abstraction. And so we think that providing applications with this hint to the resources that are available to it over some time frame allows you to write adaptive applications without going as far as saying it's a strong guarantee. Okay, so... Um, so um, now these tickets are very low level. They're very fine grained. And actually, programming with tickets is a huge pain because effectively, every time you want to do anything, you have to go to the OS and say, give me a ticket, give me a ticket, give me a ticket. Typically, what applications will do is go ask for a lot of tickets in advance of needing them, and they'll decouple the request, from the, tic the request for the tickets from the use. So they'll save up some cache of tickets effectively and use them as needed. And that allows you to address things like bursty load and so forth. Now, but it's, so it's very powerful, but you know, it's, it's a pain to use this. And as soon as we developed this programming model and I made all my students go and write code based on it, you know, they were coming to me and griping and complaining and they said, you know, of course, we don't like programming this way. I said, tough, this is your research project, you don't have a choice. I said, no, no, we don't like this model because what we find is that all the time we're writing little software patterns that are dealing with various ways of asking for and using tickets and then making decisions about whether I get the tickets or not. And it seems to me we should be able to encapsulate those decisions in a separate software module, basically something reusable. So we came up with this idea of a resource broker. Resource broker is just a module that exposes an API that lets you say to it, I'd like, for example, to perform this computation periodically, or I have a set of three different computations I'd like to perform, one that uses a lot of energy, one that uses a little bit of energy, one that uses almost no energy, please go out on my behalf and go get those tickets from the OS and mediate between myself and the OS and deal with the mechanics of the tickets and just call my callback functions when the right things happen. Does this kind of make sense? So we can capture this application adaptivity in something called a resource broker, which is just a specialized stage. Um, and we provided a small library of standard brokers, but you know, different people have built different brokers around our model. So let me give you an example of one of these. Let's go back to this application example here, and let's say that the sensor is operating in an environment where the radio bandwidth is fluctuating because the patient's moving around the home. And what we'd like to do is transmit the data to the base station that most closely matches the amount of available bandwidth. That is, we don't want to queue up packets for delivery that are just going to have to get stored in memory that we don't have. We would like to only transmit the type of data that's most likely to get through to the base station based on the current link conditions. That kind of makes sense? Yeah? So what I'm going to say here is that this stage wants to transmit 20 packets a second nominally. This one wants to transmit six packets a second, four packets, and so forth. And what we're going to do is adapt the type of data that we transmit to the base station based on the current link conditions. Now, each stage could do this itself. And this is coming to your question about the local decisions. It could go and ask for bandwidth tickets and make a decision locally. But now you've got these four stages that are all independently asking for bandwidth tickets. And you know, they don't know about each other, right? So what we could do is add a bandwidth broker in front of them. And the bandwidth broker is a module that gets information from its clients downstream on the nominal rate that they want to transmit data. 
and it makes it takes the responsibility of doing the ticket request. So in this case, it would take a look at the the, the uh, set of requests here, and it would say, okay, well, in order to satisfy these requests, I could ask for a ticket to say for the most the most that any one of them wants to transmit, 20 packets a second. And based on the current estimate of the radio link maintained by the OS, it would say, well, wait, I can't give you 20 packets. I can give you a, a ticket for 12 packets a second. Get back the ticket. And it says, oh, well, that's interesting. And fortunately, my PowerPoint mathematics works out very beautifully. I can split this ticket into three and hand each one of those stages just the right amount of bandwidth, right? And that has the effect of disabling this stage up here because it didn't get a ticket, so it's not allowed to transmit. Does that make sense? I mean, again, it's a cartoonish example, but it's meant to motivate a, a larger point. Effectively, what's happening is that this is happening, there's some periodicity at which this thing is making requests and then feeding tickets to the stages. And so when they receive a ticket, they recognize that they can use that ticket for whatever amount of data they've got currently buffered that they're uh, able to transmit. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Is the programmer able to express priority or rates? Oh, yeah. So I've glossed over all the details here. But yes, there's basically a priority system in place. It's actually we use a utility function for each one of these things. And the thing is basically doing utility maximization. But that's a policy decision. So what I want to argue here is that tickets are the mechanism, brokers are the policy, and I could implement a very wide range of policies in the broker based on what you want to do. Yeah? So I'm trying to decouple those things as much as possible. Oh, it, uh, in this case, it's just arbitrary. We gave uh, decimation of, uh, of the raw signal, the highest utility, and each one of these a lower amount of utility because they're less useful to the end user. Um, Another way that we can use brokers is to um, mitigate the energy consumption of the sensor over time. And so one way of visualizing this is if I have a battery with a given capacity and a target on the battery's lifetime, then the, there's a, that defines a nominal schedule at, of the rate at which I would like to consume energy from the battery. And this is, of course, assuming a perfect battery. And you know, we, we address all that. I'm just, again, it's a PowerPoint slide. And so if I don't do anything about, uh, I'm sorry, if, if I had a conservative policy, that would dole out energy tickets to the application at a rate to ensure that I never dipped below this target energy schedule. Yeah? So that would ensure that I would meet the lifetime target, but it would be conservative in the sense that I would never be allowed to dip below this red line. Yeah? A more um, interesting strategy is one that would allow the application to accrue some amount of energy debt. And the reason this is useful is if I have a bursty load, because the sensor, for example, is still, it's still, it's still, it's still, and then suddenly the patient starts moving, we want to start using energy. But that amount of energy that we might want to consume now might violate this red line. Yeah? This is a lot like charging to a credit card. There's oftentimes you want to make purchases, but you don't have the money in your bank account right now, but you'd like to go in charge it now and then pay it back slowly over time later. This is exactly the same model. So when we're in energy debt, we basically reduce the amount of ticket allocations to kind of bring us back to the red line. And when we have an energy surplus, we can increase the rate of ticket allocations in order to hug the line. Does this kind of make sense? Yeah? So again, this is a policy decision based on what, what you want the application to do. To give you a feeling of how this works in practice, um, let me show you a quick um, application case study where we applied this to a sensor network for uh, acoustic signature of animal uh, uh, animals in a forest setting. This is work done that was work done by Lou Gerard at, at uh, now at MIT. He was at UCLA at the time. The idea is that each sensor has a microphone. The microphone is sampling the the we're sampling the microphone at 24 kilohertz. Um, dropping the signal if there's no noise detected, and then passing the signal to one of three different detectors based on how much energy we currently have according to this energy schedule. Yeah? So if we have a lot of energy, we're going to pass it to the FFT detector that performs a really energy intensive and precise calculation to detect the marmot mating call. Um, if we don't have a lot of energy, we're just going to pass it to this cheap detector that just triggers that there's an animal call any time the acoustic signature goes above a threshold. Yeah? So this is high energy cost and very accurate, and this is low energy cost but not very accurate. 
Yeah. yeah. For the application you just identified, um, are, the, uh, are the scientists who have consumed this data comfortable with going to press with an analysis and perform? Sometimes we yep. measure this and sometimes yeah, yeah, we yeah. measure that. It's a function of how hot the battery was and what else is going That's right. Really know That's right. This is a great question. In fact, they do that all the time with their current instrumentation, but they don't know the conditions under which the instrument was operating. It might have been raining. They don't have a rain gauge out there or some kind of, you know, so there, there's all kinds of things that can trigger false positives and, and corrupt the data that they're getting, but they don't necessarily have the operational metadata to tell them what was going on in the field. So this is an effort that I want to get started where we start collecting and logging information on what the sensor network was doing and what conditions it was operating under so that we can condition the results that it's delivering back to the end user based on those operational conditions. But that's absolutely true that, you know, they already deal with that on a day-by-day -day basis. It's just that they have different constraints on their instruments. Yeah? That's a good point. Okay, so, um, so what we're going to do here is have an energy switch that, do that passes the signal to one of these detectors based on the the current state of the battery, how much energy we have. So to visualize this, this is a marmot call seen in the time domain. And as you can see, the marmot call is here, but you know, if I just use a simple threshold detector, there's probably going to be a lot of false positives there. If I look at this in the frequency domain, it looks like this, and you can see the marmot call to look a little chirp like that uh, at a very narrow frequency band. Okay, So it's easy to detect when you do the FFT. All right. So uh, let me show you um, the worst graph in the talk. Uh, this is a sample experiment run with sample data for uh, 360 seconds. And um, I'm going to walk you through this because there's a lot going on here. Each of these dots down here represents a detection of the system. Uh, that is a, a detection of a marmot chirp. And some may be false positives. Um, and the energy consumed with different strategies is shown up here. So this is normalized to the target energy schedule of 40 days of the battery lifetime. So if we hug this line here, that's 40-day lifetime target. Uh, and uh, I just mentioned that the dots are target detection. So the black dots, that's perfect. That's a perfect system. That's ground truth. That's the marmots chirping. Okay. And um, if we use an optimistic strategy, it doesn't pay any attention to battery life. We basically have 100% accuracy because it's always using the FFT detector. If we use a conservative scheme, it stays below the black line. So we're always going to maintain that 40-day lifetime target. But as you can see, there's a tremendous number of false positives because it's forced to use the lower energy threshold detector a large portion of the time. And so it ends up firing when it shouldn't. If we use this credit-based scheme, as you can see, sometimes we go above the line and sometimes we're below the line. That allows us to alternate between modes where we're using the low energy detector and the high energy detector. And so it's far more accurate. Um, and as you can see, if there's adequate energy, that is, we're below the line, it's very accurate because it's using the FFT. But if it's above the line, it has false positives because it's using the threshold detector. Yeah? I have to ask, how can I miss the chirp that's made the other This one here? Yeah. Uh, good question. This may be because, oh, yes, we're above the line. And the policy that I didn't describe very well is, when you are above the line, more than a certain amount, you go into what's called um, energy debt payback, which you're not allowed to use any more energy until you go back above the line. This is paying off your, your American Express card. You're not allowed to uh, make more charges, basically, until you have paid off your balance. So it has to not do any detections at all until the energy goes back above the line, I mean, uh, below the line in this graph. But make sense? Good point. It shut down to save energy. Okay, um, now let's see, I have five minutes left. And I'm halfway through the talk. So I'm gonna do this quickly and just give you the highlights rather than try to do the whole thing, okay? So, uh, so I've just talked to you about resource management at the node level, but what I think is also very important is resource management across a whole sensor network. And I wanna focus just on one problem, which is reliable signal collection. What we're doing on the volcano is pulling raw signals from each sensor node over a multi-hop network back to the base station following a volcanic eruption. So the first observation that we have is that not all data is created equal. Scientists care about some data more than others. This is a seismic trace from the volcano. If you're a seismologist, this is the stuff you care about because that's the interesting volcanic activity. The rest of this is noise or, or uninteresting signal for you, okay? 
Um, the other observation is that the amount of energy you have to consume in order to gather data from the network varies considerably based on which node you're pulling the data from. So in this network, if I have a node that's one hop from the base station, that might take, you know, 2,000 millijoules or so to pull that signal from the node. If I have a node that's several hops away, it's going to consume a lot more energy because it has to traverse multiple nodes and each one of those nodes has to forward the data along, yeah? So what we have here is a problem where we want to optimize the overall quality of the data we're getting, but we're subject to a resource constraint, namely the bandwidth and the energy that's available on each node. So what we've done is developed a system called Lance, named after this guy here. And this is a system for priority-driven allocation of bandwidth and storage. So what we're doing is we're prioritizing which signals we download from which nodes using a model of the network topology and the energy consumed for each of those download operations. Um, like Pixie, Lance decouples the mechanisms from the policy so you can configure Lance in a way that allows the end user to optimize for different types of data acquisition policies. So for a good example of that is I might want to get, I might want to maximize the fairness of the data that I've collected from the network or I might want to maximize spatial data distribution by getting data from lots of different nodes at different times and so forth. There's lots of ways of parameterizing the system to have different objective functions. Uh, the student who's working on this is graduating this year. He's going to be on the job market. The next version of the system we're going to name um, Floyd, which is Lance on steroids. Sorry, bicycling joke. Um, okay, so to give you a sense of how the system works, um, each of the sensor nodes is sampling its signal and it's um, chunking the data that it samples into what we call application data units, which is the atomic unit of data transfer. So in our system, that represents um, uh, uh, 60 seconds worth of data. That's a few tens of kilobytes. All right? Uh, what the, each node does is it um, takes the raw signal and it computes a value, which is a very coarse grain representation of how valuable the signal is to the end user, to the domain scientist. For the seismic monitoring case, we use something called the RSAM, the Reduced Seismic Amplitude Measure, which is a fancy way of saying we take the average peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the data in the ADU and use that as the value. The idea being that with greater amplitude in the signal, that's of greater value to the end user. Yeah? And that's what the seismologist wants, so that works well. This is then compressed. So basically, we've taken, we've got a compressed version of the signal, very, very coarse grain compressed. We take 60 seconds worth of data and turn it into basically four bytes. Yeah? Those summaries are then transmitted back to the base station. So we get this summary information from all the nodes in the network. That's very low bit rate. And then the base station takes this and um, it uses a model of the network topology, that is, of the, how the nodes are connected together and what the routing tree looks like. It knows the battery level of the nodes because that's coming in periodic heartbeat information. And it has a model of the energy cost to download data from each node in the network, which I'm not going to have time to get into the details. But basically, the model says, when I'm downloading data from a node, I have to account for the cost for reading from flash, transmitting the packets over the radio. If I'm routing through a node, it has to receive the packets and then retransmit them. Some nodes are going to experience an energy cost because they're overhearing packets that were not destined for them, right? So we take all these things into account and come up with a model that says, when I'm downloading data from this node, how much energy is consumed on all these other nodes? Yeah? Is that with respect to an instantaneous perspective, or is it also anticipating what might happen in the future? In this, right now, actually, we're just looking at the current, the cur we're just, we're, we, we do it completely online. We don't even do any prediction in the future. Uh, I'll show you in a minute how well this works. I was skeptical that this would work well, but it did. Um, okay, so, so what it does is it uses this model and the summary values, and then it computes a score. The score represents the final desirability of downloading a given ADU from a given node in the network. And I'm just showing them as colors here, and I'm not even telling you what the function is that maps from, uh, from this to this, because it's complicated and I don't have time. So you'll have to trust me that this makes sense. And what it does is it takes the highest scoring ADUs, the ones with the, the highest score, and it downloads them from the network. Yeah? We leave the others behind. So we're downloading a subset of the data from the network that maximizes these scores. Okay? Are there timeouts on how, much you, how long you buffer or how 
Yeah, there is a timeout because these guys only had one megabyte of flash, so there's a 20-minute timeout period that they could buffer the data, and if you didn't download it within 20 minutes, it was gone because it's a circular buffer. Uh, it takes about five minutes to download one of these from a node that's several hops away. It takes quite a while, so we have a problem there. Yeah. The newer nodes we're designing have a micro SD flash. We can put a few gigabytes on there, so that problem goes away. Yeah. Um, so abstractly speaking, we have an optimization problem here. We have all the ADUs in the network. The vector of energy capacity at each node, that is the amount of battery, uh, the, the number of joules left in each node's battery. And for each ADU, we have a cost function and a value function. And what we'd like to do is download the optimal set. The optimal set is the set of ADUs that maximize the sum of the value subject to the sum of the cost being less than the amount of energy that's in each node's battery. Yeah. If you formulate it this way, this is a multidimensional knapsack problem. There's a known solution. This is very straightforward to go solve. But that requires that I know the, all the ADUs that will ever be sampled by the network in the future. Yeah? I have to have future knowledge to do that. So what we need is an online greedy approximation of this. And we have a very simple one. I'm not going to get into all the details. But let me show you the results. And I'll explain how we do that heuristic as I show you the results. So here is a. Um, uh, a 10 node linear chain network. And um, if I, uh, the y axis is the percent of the amount of data that I downloaded from each node. So I've got 10 bars, one for each node. And if I only consider the value of the data, then as you can see, I get basically the same amount of data from each node because we didn't consider the cost at all. Yeah? Didn't care which node it was getting the data from, it just got the same amount. If I only consider the cost of downloading the data, then as you can see, I bias very much towards nodes near the sink because the nodes near the sink have much lower energy costs, and so we end up downloading far more data from them. That's what you'd expect, so it's a, it's a bias. But this is not optimal. What's optimal is this. If I do the multidimensional knapsack problem, this is the result I get. This is the optimal data distribution, but our online version of this gets almost exactly optimal. I mean, it's so close. It's like 99.5% of optimal or something like that. What we're doing basically is, if you want to talk to me offline, I can explain it. It's basically a heuristic that says um, scale the value of the ADU by the energy consumed on the node that has the least amount of energy available, the bottleneck node. And if you do that, it works very beautifully. So this is a really nice result because it says an online heuristic very closely approximates an optimal data distribution. Are there questions about this? Okay, I'm, yes? Yes, absolutely. So our model takes all that into account. So the nodes that are close to the sink use a lot more energy because they're doing a lot more packet forwarding. Yeah, in our case, in this, in this experiment, we just gave every node the same battery to start with. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, and I've got results actually for a 150 node test bed running across three floors of our building, and you can go read the paper. Yes? Yeah, in terms of the ranking, that's right. That's right. But the total amount of data from each node is very different. Okay, so let me just, so, so that was, that sort of simulation, it's a sort of nice, you know, clean environment. Does it work in the real world? Yes, so we went back to the volcano and we deployed the system on the volcano to try it out for a few days. This is an example of spending $50,000 to get one paper accepted. Uh, and so we set up this network here on Tungurawa, that's Steve Dawson Haggerty, who's now a grad student at Berkeley, setting up one of the sensor nodes. We replaced the grad student with an undergrad. They're cheaper and they work harder. Um, and uh, when we did this deployment, one of the problems we had was the day before we got down there, the volcano was extremely active. It was erupting every hour or so. Very exciting activity. The seismologists were calling us from Ecuador, get down here, this is really great. So we get there and we set up the nodes on the volcano and for the rest of the week, nothing. The volcano just stopped doing anything interesting. We call this, we fixed the volcano by putting the sensors on it. And uh, so this is an example of a little earthquake that we got. This is like a burp. This is nothing. Here's another one, very uninteresting. 
Uh, we downloaded this. Hey, this looks very exciting. We were very excited to see this. What is that? Oh, actually, that was the uh, Steve stomping his foot next to the seismometer five times to test that it was working. Yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, the amount of data that the, the volcano was not so cooperative in producing interesting signals from a seismology point of view, but our system worked correctly. And if you distill all this down, basically Lance downloaded 99.5% of the data that an optimal offline solution would have downloaded. If we did the analysis after the fact, looked at all the data that could have been downloaded, we got 99.5% of optimal. So I'm very pleased with that result because it says that Lance did the right thing in the field, although the volcano was not that cooperative. Okay, so I'm kind of out of time here, so I just want to um, mention two quick things. The first thing is a uh, couple of future projects. The first one is I've talked about sensor uh, Pixie managing resources on a node level. Lance is a central controller that manages the whole network. What we'd like to do is have the nodes themselves work together and collaborate to do resource management within the network rather than have to rely on a centralized controller. And this is an operating system that we're building now called Peloton, which is named after this thing here, which is a pack of cyclists that ride very closely together in a road race in order to reduce the wind drag collectively, yes? Uh, the other key, f so they're very efficient when they work together like this. The problem with the Peloton, of course, is that if any one of them falls over, then the whole thing crashes. Um, uh, and the other project that we are starting up now, we have this um, cool grant to do um, uh, RoboBees. You can find out about it on my webpage. This is a uh, uh, micro-scale flapping wing insects that we have developed that the idea we're going to build a swarm of these things and they're going to be used for crop pollination and search and rescue and they're all going to be very small and they're going to have sensors and, and radios and all this kind of stuff. This is a prototype. This does fly. It's a really cool device. You can see it's wired to a 1.2 kilovolt power supply. So we have some work cut out for us to make this thing really autonomous. But it's a fun project and I'm going to be working on the swarm operating system for this. Okay, so basically that's all I had. Um, uh, what I was trying to get across is that, you know, we, we think sensor nets have a lot of advantage for scientists, but we have this massive resource management challenge ahead of us, and my belief is that we need to be thinking about resource management from the programming model at both the node and the network level in order to make these things efficient and usable. And that's it. I'll take some more questions if you have them. Thanks.